Hello, and welcome to the Introduction to Microsurgery, Part 1. My name is Dr. Stephen Christensen, and in this video I will discuss the history of microvascular surgery and will review several important principles of vessel repair and microsurgical instrumentation. In the 1800s, surgeons experimented with various methods of repairing damaged blood vessels, including removal of the damaged area of the vessel with insertion of a piece of hollowed glass or plaster. In 1897, American physician John Murphy became the first physician to successfully complete a human end-to-end -end arterial anastomosis. Murphy's technique included resection of the damaged portion of the vessel with invagination of one cut arterial end into the other and partial thickness sutures to hold the vessels in place. The next major breakthrough was by Alexis Carroll in 1902. His method, known as the triangulation method, involved the approximation of two arterial ends by three separate interrupted sutures spaced one-third of the way around the vessel's circumference. Retraction on each suture tented the vessel open and enabled placement of a continuous suture while avoiding catching the back wall of the vessel, a complication to be discussed later. Carroll's work on vascular surgical techniques eventually led to his receiving the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1912. Prior to demonstration of the procedure, let's review some basic principles of vascular surgery. Here you see graphical and histologic depictions of an artery and a vein separated by a capillary network. As you recall, arteries and veins have three primary tissue layers, the tunica intima, media, and adventitia. The innermost layer, the tunica intima, is made of a one-cell thick layer of endothelial cells and a subendothelial layer of connective tissue, which is supported by an internal elastic lamina. The middle layer, the tunica media, contains elastic material and smooth muscle, which controls vessel vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Notice the increased muscle in the tunica media of arteries compared to veins. You will appreciate this difference when you perform the venous anastomosis, as the decreased muscle present in veins compared to arteries causes the vein walls to be thin, friable, and easy to collapse, making venous repair much more difficult. Finally, the outermost layer, the tunica adventitia, which is also known as the tunica externa, protects, reinforces, and anchors the vessel to surrounding structures. When your needle penetrates the vessel wall, it disrupts the endothelial layer of the tunica intima, exposing platelets within the bloodstream to the subendothelial layers that are rich in collagen. This is the first step to formation of a platelet plug and clot formation. While a small degree of platelet exposure to subendothelial collagen promotes platelet aggregation, excessive exposure may lead to excessive platelet deposition and the unintended production of a thrombus. Minimizing vessel damage and exposure to subendothelial tissue is critical to vessel anastomosis inasmuch as the endothelium will regenerate within 7 to 10 days, but the elastic and muscular components of the tunica media and adventitia will never return to their pre-injury state. In an effort to minimize vessel damage, you may be tempted to place sutures through only a partial thickness of the vessel wall. This, however, is not recommended. In one study, authors found that full thickness sutures provided adequate continuity of the tunica intima with minimal platelet aggregation and anastomotic bleeding compared to partial thickness sutures. Partial thickness sutures may also produce a false vessel lumen and potential development of an aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. Students learning microsurgical vessel anastomosis often wonder how many sutures to place and if additional sutures should be placed in the event of uneven spacing to decrease potential bleeding. Remember, however, that with each additional suture, there is additional damage to the vessel wall. A study involving rabbit end-to-end -end carotid artery anastomoses compared placement of 8 sutures with placement of 16 sutures. The authors found that tensile strength, collagen amount, histologic analysis, and rates of vessel patency and thrombosis were similar between those with 8 or 16 sutures. Given the lack of significant benefit to placement of additional sutures, 
and given added time in the operating room, the eight suture technique is considered the gold standard and is the technique used in this course. Let's now review the basics of microsurgery instrumentation. Here you see the instruments you will be using, the micro needle holder, micro scissors, toothed and non-toothed dissecting forceps, jeweler's forceps, and the single and tandem clamps. When holding the instruments, use this hand position, holding the needle holder like a pencil, and providing four points of contact with the thumb, pointer, middle finger, and hand. One of the greatest difficulties for beginners of microsurgery is proper positioning of the needle within the jaws of the needle holder. Fortunately, you will be using flat needles, whose flat shaft facilitates alignment of the needle within the needle holder. Lift the suture until the needle just touches the surface below. This will facilitate rotating and orienting the needle appropriately within the needle holder along the flat surface of the needle shaft. This concludes part one of the introduction to microsurgery. In part two, I will describe the steps of the femoral artery end-to-end -end anastomosis.